there are times in the Christian life where uh, this song particularly resonates, where we understand and we feel affliction and pain, and we cry out to God, Oh God, deliver me. Where are these wonderful promises you give to us in Jesus Christ? And uh, the end of that line of thinking is always, Where is Jesus Christ? Why has he not yet come back? And so we sing, Let your salvation lift me up on high and set me free. And so we are people uh, that are living expectantly. And our text uh, this afternoon focuses on that expectant living. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 14 through 18. I'd like to read that with you. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. And count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. Now there are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your stability. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Beloved well, brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ, waiting isn't easy. To wait is to expect something to happen. You might be waiting for a wedding day, waiting for summer vacation, waiting for a vacation, any vacation, waiting to find a future spouse, waiting for a new job, waiting for a raise. Waiting isn't easy. And one of the reasons why waiting is so hard is because we want to be doing something. When so often there's nothing to do but wait. If you can just imagine a young man, perhaps like Jeremy or Levi, I'm not suggesting anything here, but as a young man is waiting for his date to show up, he waits. And as he waits, they're a little delayed. They check their watch, check the mirror, check the hair, check the breath, maybe, check the body odor, maybe check the clothing, check the shoes, check to make sure they're ready for the date. But meanwhile, they're waiting. And... In the case of most young men excitedly waiting for a date, they know they're ready. Why? Because they've looked in the mirror already. But waiting isn't easy. They want to be doing something. Now, as we go into our text, the year is probably 64 AD, 65 AD, around there. About 32 years earlier, Jesus Christ had ascended into heaven, and the disciples had received this promise and that he will return in the same way from heaven. And that launched the Christian church for a time of brief waiting for the Holy Spirit to be poured out. And then, as the Holy Spirit was poured out and the Christian church exploded, from Jerusalem to Samaria to the ends of the earth, across the Roman Empire, and eventually across the globe, church waited and is waiting. Now, the time between Jesus' ascension and the writing of this letter is, like I said, about 32 years. 32 years doesn't seem like a lot to us. It doesn't sound like a long time, but if you Take a step back and think about how much has happened in the past 32 years. It's quite significant. 32 years ago, 1989, there were no cell phones, no Wi-Fi, very little internet. Computers were just starting to become a household name. The world has changed quite a bit in 32 years. Now, for these Christians back then, those 32 years also held a lot of change. Christianity had become a recognized religion, so much so that they were increasingly persecuted. This will be probably less than a year or so before some of the key apostles, Peter and Paul, would be martyred, would be killed for their faith. Now, if you're waiting 
for a promise to be fulfilled. If you're waiting expectantly, you begin to wonder, is my waiting in vain? Is my date going to really show up? Or, in the case of the early church, is the bridegroom, Jesus Christ, is he really going to return? So Paul, or Peter, as he's writing this letter, he's writing to the church and he is saying, I'm writing these things to you. Why? So that you may know your waiting is not in vain. We read in verse uh, 3, uh, both I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder. In other words, I want you to know that your waiting is is fixated on the return of Jesus Christ. And there are things that he calls us to do as we wait. And so I want to encourage all of us this afternoon, but especially Levi and Jeremy as well. Now that you're doing this profession of faith, and and in some ways you're you're taking another step in in your journey of faith, and you're taking responsibility, and you're saying, yes, I know I'm a child of God. My parents have taught that to me. We've learned that, and I've learned to live that. And I want to stand and publicly proclaim that to the world. Perhaps we'll be able to hear you today. I don't know. Normally we're inside. So, but the main point for this message is live expectantly for Jesus' return. Live expectantly for Jesus' return. There's going to be four things that I want you to remember. Diligently prepare to be found by him. Count our Lord's patience as salvation. Don't be carried away and lose your stability. And then finally grow in grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. There's four points, but when we come to that final fourth point, you'll begin to see that really that's the main point. Living expectantly for Jesus' return is growing in grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. And as you do that, one, two, three, uh, continue to fall into place. But we'll get there. First point, diligently prepare to be found by him. Peter writes, therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, what are they waiting for? They're waiting for Jesus' return and for the new heavens and the new earth, a place where there is no sin, no sorrow, no suffering, a place where all things are made new, a place where we don't have to wrestle with sin and the consequences of sin, which is death. They're waiting for these. Jesus Christ is coming. And Peter says, since you are waiting for these, That assumes you are. Waiting for these, be diligently to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. In other words, Jesus Christ is coming back and he's coming back, not just in this global general sense, but he's coming for you. And he's coming to find you. You are preparing as a bride is preparing for the bridegroom. You are preparing for that great feast. How will you be prepared? And so what can you be doing? What shall we be doing while we are waiting? Waiting is easier when we know what we should be doing. It's not make lots of money, get a great career, establish your success, get all kinds of credentials, dominate the world. No. Be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. If I can summarize that, Peter is saying, wash up. Wash up. Be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish. A spot or blemish refers to sin in our life. Sin is a stain, a mark on our life that needs removing. Now we know that we are washed clean by the blood of the the lamb and that we are viewed innocent and spotless by God simply by faith in Jesus Christ. But as we walk in that joyful reality, God works in us. And, And Paul says and Peter says, be at war against sin. Don't let this dirt on the soul just sit there as you wait for Jesus. Wash up. And how do you do that? Well, 
God's word is clear. You grow in the grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ. You come to understand that you are washed clean, not because of what you've done, but because of the blood of Jesus Christ. That Jesus Christ died on the cross so that by faith in him, you are washed clean. And that it's a, a free wash. It's a, it's a gracious wash. Come to me, he says, and I will make you clean. No payment needed. So what does this look like practically? Well, one of the ways that you do this is you continue to stare into the mirror that is the law of God. And you don't do that in isolation from Jesus Christ. No, you, you look at God's law and then you see it embodied in the life and the love of Jesus Christ. A, a, a love towards God and, and neighbor that says, I will sacrifice my life in order to treasure this relationship. And then as you recognize uh, the, the stain where you're not living in that way, you confess. You confess your sin before God. You say, Lord, there is this blemish. There is this thing in the past that I've had that, that needs to be forgiven, that needs to be washed clean. Lord, cleanse me, restore me. And then as you find yourself constantly battling against the same kind of sin, it continues to happen through daily repentance, confession, and forgiveness. There's never a moment where you can sit back and say, you know what, I've confessed this once, it came back again the next day. Well, muddy trousers, that's fine. Jesus will just have to deal with that when he comes. No, you continue to wash in the blood of the Lamb through daily repentance and forgiveness. And so you're diligently preparing to be found by him without spot or blemish as you are washed out. And Peter adds in there, and at peace. Well, what happens is as this, this sin that creates conflict, conflict between you and God and conflict between you and your neighbor, as that is washed there's a restoration of relationship. You're at peace because you know in your heart of hearts that there's nothing between the two of you. And so you can be found at peace with God and with neighbor as you are diligent in being found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. So if I can encourage you, if I can encourage you all, embrace that word, be diligent. Be diligent. It's an energetic eagerness. As eager as you might be waiting for a date to make sure you look presentable far more eagerly, be diligent to be found by him. One of the ways that you do that is you uh, continue to go before God. One of the ways we can do that together, and there's the blessing of relationship, being and living in community where we can gather together is we're willing to love each other enough to say, hey, you have a gob of mustard on your face. That's how I know someone loves me when they're willing to point out the dirt, the flaw. Why? Because they recognize that I long to be clean. And so with sin as well. Not in a judgmental way, but knowing that we all have that longing to be washed clean. And we can take one another to the cross of Jesus Christ. So that's the first point. Be diligent in preparing to be found by him. And then secondly, count our Lord's patience as salvation. This is verse 15 and 16. And count the patience of our Lord as salvation. Just as our brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. So basically Peter there is just saying, I've told you that, that God is coming and he's uh, he's coming and he's being patient and he's coming. Paul has said this as well. So recognize. You see, 32 years is hard, especially when people begin to laugh at you. And that's what was happening in Peter's time. Scoffers were coming with scoffing. What might it have sounded like? This is what it might have sounded like for wicked men who scoff at the lives of those who trust in Jesus Christ. You're living a fool's dream. You're missing out on life. 
doing all of this Christianity stuff, being generous, worshiping God, uh, tormenting yourself and trying to fight against sin and, and washing up. And frankly, you're not doing a great job at it. But we're living life. We're enjoying life. Sinning isn't so bad. It's fun. It's freeing. Everyone does it. Who says we can't? And besides, Jesus isn't coming back. He's not coming back to judge the living and the dead. Do you really believe that? And so what was happening in the, the, that time is these scoffers were saying, this is ridiculous, this faith that you're holding on to. And it's not just that you're holding on to this faith. You're transforming your life on this expectation. You're living completely different because you expect this promise of Christ coming to be fulfilled. Now, far too often, we see delay as powerlessness. Some of the kids here might know that when you're doing something bad and your parents see it and they say, don't do it, but they don't do anything else. You're like, oh, maybe I can do it again. If all they're going to say is don't do it, I can deal with that. And so you do it again. We sometimes see delay of punishment as powerlessness. Well, Peter says it's not, it's patience. Count the patience of our Lord. He is being patient. Now you might say, well, 32 years, that's a patient God, but Pastor Jerry, it's 1,989 years. It's a lot longer than 32 years. He's still not returned. And the world has changed dramatically. We've got science, we've got technology, we've got power. Humanity can conquer the world, and we understand so far, so much more. Surely, you're not still going to believe this dream of Christ's return. It's not hard to find scoffers today. All you have to do is look at comment sections in any article that talks about the Christian faith, and you'll see somewhere in the comments... Oh, these people believe in a fairy god in heaven. Fairy god up in the sky. So how are we to think about it? Well, here's a blessing. That God's word doesn't just speak specifically to a people in a time and a place, but it speaks uh, also globally and continually. Why? Because by God's grace, in this passage, and we read it, Peter reminds us, uh, that our sense of time is not God's sense of time. Second Peter 3, verse 8. Do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. In other words, here's your human timeline, and you find yourself in this specific moment, and you think this is the most important moment in all of history. And whereas God says, one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like one day. Your timeline and my timeline... Don't try to match it up. And then just from a human perspective, as I perhaps fall into that very trap, it was 4,000 years, at least more than 4,000 years before Christ's first coming. It's been 2,000 years where human race, and the Christian church is expecting the second coming. Lord Jesus hasn't returned yet. Why? Why? Do you know? Do you know why Jesus Christ hasn't returned yet? The Bible tells us. Right in the point, the second point. Count the Lord's patience as salvation. He's being patient. He's being patient. Why? For the salvation of souls. Your soul, and not only your soul, but the souls of all people. As First, Second Peter says, he doesn't desire anyone to perish. And so Peter is launching the church into a mission of compassion for the lost. And he's basically telling you and me, God's patience is our God-given opportunity. Why? Because Jesus Christ is coming back. And he is calling all people to repentance. And his patience presents us with one more day of opportunity to lift high the name of Jesus Christ, to speak of the great love of God. 
And so you, as you're thinking about the coming of Christ, be diligent in preparing. Wash up. Count the Lord's patience as salvation. See, this is his great opportunity. And don't be carried away and lose your stability. That's the third point. Why? Because Peter says, you therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand. He's encouraging his readers. He's saying, look, you shouldn't be surprised. Why? Because God has told us. You shouldn't be surprised because you know this beforehand. And so you shouldn't be surprised and get carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability. In other words, you who've been told beforehand that this is the story of God's salvation, don't you turn the word of the living God into a, a piecemeal book of myths and proverbs that you just decide what is going to be true and what's not going to be true? Don't you turn the law of God into an optional advice to be considered or rejected if you don't like it or you don't think it fits with the way that you're living or the way that your culture is telling you to live? Don't you think that the promises that God makes about Jesus Christ's return and the new heaven and new earth, don't you think that those promises are just human wishes? No, the living God has spoken and the living God has promised and the living God will fulfill. He says, you, knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not carried away and lose your own stability. One of my earliest memories of uh, Cape Town, South Africa, uh, was, or of, of the beach, was in Cape Town, South Africa. I was probably five or so, and I was playing right in that area uh, where the water runs up the sloping front of the beach, and then it runs back again in a, in a backwash. And there was this one moment where there's this particularly large wave that resulted in this strong backwash, me being uh, the little boy that I was. My feet were flipped out from under me, and I was rapidly carried down into the ocean. I lost my stability and my footing. And if you've ever had that kind of experience, whether it's uh, at the beach in a backwash or whether it's on black ice that you didn't see, you realize that you are beginning to be powerless. You've lost all stability. Well, Peter says, that's what happens if you begin to say and pick apart the promises of God and think it's all foolishness. You lose your stability, your foundation for life, and you begin to be searching. And we see this so often. You're searching. You're searching here. You're searching there. Where's the meaning of life? How can I find satisfaction? How can I find fulfillment? Why do I never get what I want? And then you're surprised when you grow old and your body falls apart. You're surprised when death faces you. Peter says, you don't have to be surprised. God's word has been clear all along. He has told the story so very clearly for us. So knowing this, don't be carried away and lose your stability. Stand on the word of truth. Be rooted in the word of truth. Don't pick and pull it apart but recognize what God has promised and what God has done and tell that and to the next generation and hold on to it for yourself. Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. See there, Peter, there Paul in 1 Corinthians, he's linking the reality of what happened to the prophecy that foretold it. Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. He was buried, he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And I can tell you here, Christ will return in accordance with the scriptures. As God has promised, so he will fulfill. And the Bible also says, but concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven or the Son, but the Father only. So knowing that we do not know when that day might come, watch yourself says the Bible, lest your hearts be weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and cares of this life, and that day come upon you suddenly like a trap. Stay awake at all times, praying that you may have strength to escape all these things that are going to take your place. 
You see, beloved brothers and sisters, and, and Jeremy and Levi, there's going to be moments in life where Satan is going to tempt you to place all of your hope on some situation, something in your life, a new car, a new truck, a new job, a new career, a spouse, a, a recovery, and he will say, put all of your baskets in that egg. But God's word says, no. Understand what God is doing in the great story that he's writing in the return of Jesus Christ. Be waiting for him. Someday he will return and you'll uh, see all of this and you'll, you'll, you'll see that Ford F-150 and you'll be like, oh, I was so passionate about that. And now look how small it is. Insignificant. Why? Because God lays out clearly for us. Christ is coming. Be diligent in preparing. There's a new heaven and a new earth coming, and you're living for that moment. Be diligent in preparing. And he's being patient to give you opportunity, not only in your own life, but to spread the gospel message. And he's calling you to, to see this and to know this and not lose your stability. Therefore, I'm going to find my text again. You, therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability. But, and here's the final point, and this is the main point of the passage, because how does all of the, how do all of these three things happen? Grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. What's the best way? What's the only way to diligently be preparing to be found by him, spotless, blameless, and at peace? Grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. How can you come to that place where you count the salvation or the Lord's patience as salvation? Have you understand why he's being patient? You grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You begin to understand his heart for sinners, that he came to seek and save the lost, and that he has sent you, his disciples, uh, to continue to proclaim that message in the world. How do you not get carried away and lose your stability? You grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. You see, Satan tempts us when we begin to lose our stability to try to look elsewhere to find stability. Maybe church isn't working out. Maybe my faith isn't working out. Maybe those scoffers that are laughing at me, maybe they've got a little bit of truth there. Satan tempts us. He begins to, like that wave on the beach, kind of pull us back in. But then God's word reaches out in grace. This is the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The reason you are here today is not because you had some great aha moment. No, it was because God has been patiently at work in you, bringing you to this point. Reminding me of what happened when I was flying over the ocean. And this is probably why I have that great memory. It was my dad's arm that just grabbed my arm. And I felt that arm sometimes where it's a, it's a, a strong grab of punishment is coming. But in that moment, oh, I was overjoyed because I had lost all stability. I had lost all hope. But my earthly father reached out and grabbed me and pulled me from the waves. Beloved, this is our heavenly father. And this is what he does as he brings the word, as he brings us into communion, as he brings friends into our lives that speak the truth of Jesus Christ into our lives, as he opens the opportunity for Bible study and then brings us there, kicking and screaming sometimes. He restores us. He strengthens our soul. And so you increasingly begin to see that it is by grace. It is God who graciously sent Jesus Christ to die for you. It is God who graciously, graciously made these promises to you. It's God who graciously preached this word to you. It is God who graciously restores you by the power of his spirit. 
And so there is encouragement at the end. Grow. Mature. Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Grow in your understanding that it is a free gift, an incredible gift to the undeserving, where so often you wander away and you think, I probably can't come back now. How embarrassing would that be to show up in church when everyone knows what I did? But as you mature, as you grow in grace and knowledge, you know there's no better place to go. There are no better, there's no better Lord that will embrace you. There's no better Savior that can carry the consequence of what you've done. As you do so, you grow in the knowledge. You grow in what he is doing and how he has done it and what he will do and the way that he will do it. You see, waiting can be hard. And sometimes we don't focus, well, often we don't focus on the return of Jesus Christ. But we are waiting. There are people that are waiting. And it can be hard and it can be frustrating and we can think, well, if that's so important, then why does this job feel so important? Why does this career feel so important? If that's so important. Waiting can be hard. Waiting is harder if you think there's nothing to do. But beloved of Jesus Christ, we do have something to do as we wait. Be diligently prepared to be found by him without spot or blemish at peace with God and people. We count salvation as patience. We see his patience as our God-given opportunity. And we constantly guard ourselves to ensure that we stand on the word of God. And how do we do this? We grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. We look to Jesus. God shifts our eyes back to Jesus Christ. He did so this morning. And he reminds us through that powerful miracle. He does so this afternoon. And as we do so, we'll increasingly be able to say this, not only mentally, but emotionally and passionately, to him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. To him be the glory. We're here now, and we can see the glory here, and we can see the glory on that day of eternity. So grow. Mature. Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And give him the glory. Amen.